Good evening and welcome to Cascade Community Foundation's Q&A live stream series. Tonight, the finale of our third season, a deep dive into one of America's most taboo topics, money, and the bold initiative on the part of area experts, residents, and business owners to help viewers like you unravel the mystery of why we so often avoid sharing our money woes. In a few minutes, we'll hear the personal testimony of Scott Dobson, ironically the son of a financial advisor and a banking professional himself. For years, Scott grappled with something so many of us fall victim to, a behavior known as keeping up with the Joneses that plagues so many right here in our home communities of Ada, Cascade, and Forest Hills. Scott is joined by his colleague, Lynn Jarman Johnson. Together at Consumers Credit Union, they have helped develop an array of services for both businesses and families. The goal, to help eliminate the anxiety that accompanies so many facing financial pitfalls or support your initiative to implement a home budget or provide useful financial tools for your employees at work. But first, I'd like to welcome our studio guest today. Fred Pinnell is a certified public accountant and founding partner at Pinnell CPA in Cascade, Michigan. Fred, you've spent two decades as an expert in tax strategies, uh, business operations, family and business advisory services, as well as corporate accounting. Uh, throughout this series, we've talked to a variety of residents and business owners who themselves have fallen into a trap of trying to keep up with the Joneses, grinding through a business that uh, really, they're not able to pay the bills all the time. Uh, they admit to the reluctance of better understanding financial principles, but kind of fall short of fearing the unknown that they may uh, run into, uh, almost want, not wanting to know the truth at times of what a ledger might show to them. Uh, how often do you and your team come across this anxiety that people feel when you're first reaching out and, and having contact with a client? Yeah, uh, money is one of the, the most often things to bring stress and anxiety to either a family, uh, financial situation, or the relationship, or even or a business owner's uh, s set of financials when we're working with them and reviewing um, the decisions they're making and how that's impacting uh, their lives. We had the pleasure of being invited into a local consumers credit union branch where Lynn Jarman Johnson sat down with our colleague Scott Dobson who shared his personal testimony that we think might be familiar to some of you. Take a look. Joining us today is Scott Dobson. Scott, you are the Consumers at Work Manager with the Consumers Credit Union. And I have had the pleasure of working with you for over 10 years. Yep. And I love your story. Not only do I love your story because it's so true and real and personal, but you've taken something that was a hardship and turned it into lifelong learning for you mm -hmm. and now for others. Welcome. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself, and we, we, we really are going to dig deep into okay. what you've been doing and how you started. You provide financial wellness to companies throughout West Michigan, through yes. Michigan. Yes. Tell, tell me a little <clears throat> bit about your position and what you do. Sure. Well, I'll back up a little bit. I was a farm boy. <laughs> uh, I grew up on a farm in, in southern Michigan. My dad was a certified financial planner, so my whole life I've grown up around money and finances and how to handle it. Um, and I didn't so, do very well for a long time with well, it. Well, when, when you were actually growing up in mm -hmm. a family where your, your father is, is educating others, was mm -hmm. that something that was part of your everyday language at the dinner table? Yep, absolutely. Yep, I, I understood um, terms of finance that probably most people wouldn't just because of uh, what my dad did and, and his areas of expertise. Um, the funniest thing is for like 30 years I didn't pay any attention to anything that he had said to me around the dinner table for my whole childhood. So probably part of the reason you're having me here today is I'm a, I'm a good example of both what not to do and what to do. But yeah, I grew up with um, the right advantages. You know, I, my mom and dad were always there. I had a nice family. Um, I knew about uh, being financially well and how important a good credit score was. Um, all of those things, um, but I still didn't pay attention until I really grew up when I was maybe you know 35 or 40 years old. <laughs> really? So tell us what happened. Like you, sure. you went to college, or um, you know I was yeah I went to college. I graduated um, early. I went when I was young, so I started college when I was 17. Um, on my 18th birthday, when I was at college, I got an offer in the mail for a credit card. And may, maybe it's because I was immature. Maybe it was because um, my dad did help me with all of my money and I never really had my own money to just blow or whatever. I applied for the credit card. I got the credit card. Um, 
How and much I, was it at that time? I believe it, I had a $1,200 credit limit. Um, and I was a freshman in college working on the farm on the weekends that I went home. And, um, you know, I bought a big screen TV for my, for my dorm room for like $950 like the first week. And I could not have been happier for that week or two. <laughs> first bill comes. First bill comes. Yeah, I don't remember it specifically, but I remember thinking, oh, this is cake. It was like $13 or something, right? Like it was just the, uh, and I, I paid that and I paid it the next month and I did that for a long time and I really got used to paying a bill every single month, which in hindsight seems like a, a bad idea. The but, minimum amount you paid. Oh yeah, oh, yes, I was a poor, co I mean, I was eating, you know, beans and rice. For, I had no money at all. So the $13 was probably a scrape at some times. Um, but yeah, I, I, had, I, I guess I wasn't mature enough to say I should wait for this. I don't have the money to buy it. I shouldn't do it right now. Um, I was... I was, like I said, I was young and immature and I wanted it and someone get like, we'll loan you the money. And I was like, absolutely give it to me. This is still happening every single day now with young people. Sure. Yeah. I tell, I mean, I tell this story all the time. Um, I also tell them that I, I paid that um, TV off nine years after I got it. I finally paid that credit card off. You know, I'd had two jobs and it just How sat there. How much was that then? Do you it think? had to, I had to spend $4,500 on that $900 TV oh, for sure. Um, and a good life lesson. I wish I had been more mature and I would have learned it without spending the $4,500. But um, I guess that's why I'm here today. So maybe other people will say, oh, you know what? You can make mistake with your finances. Um, it happens. And then you live and learn and, and do better the next time. So what happened? Was there like a steamroll effect for you where, uh, you know, it just felt like there, it's easy money right at the beginning? Yep. Yep. And, and it's easy money. And then I, I feel like I got into the habit of, I got a credit card bill. So if I got another credit card bill, it wasn't really a big deal or another bill, like paying bills all the time, um, wasn't a big deal. And then I got done with college and got a job and then you get a car because you feel like you have to buy a car. Um, people feel like they have to have a brand new Tesla every year, especially if their neighbor has one in the driveway. But, um, you know, I just got in that habit of, of spending money. And as soon as I got it, I spent it. And it felt good for that moment when I had it and was spending it. But then, then later it would kind of eat at you. And really, I guess what I learned when I grew up, I guess I grew up and maybe I was 35 years old. And I decided one day that the, that the debt that I had and my mismanagement of my own money just made me feel uncomfortable. And really, like I woke up one day and I'm like, I have this and this and, I, and my next paycheck comes and I don't have it all figured out and I should. I work at a bank. My dad was a certified financial planner. I've had every single opportunity and it's a wreck and it made me feel terrible. And it was that bad feeling that made me finally decide to do something. So Scott, as you're looking back on it, this is something that's happening every single day. Um, we talk about the fact that there's easy mean money, but what you're just saying is, look, look at I, I need a car. Yep. So I'm going to get a car so I can go to work. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, you're looking at Friday coming. You don't have the money. Yep. You know, tell us about that feeling yeah. where you're just going, I, I truly am living paycheck to paycheck. Yep. I, I didn't even realize that, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that they live paycheck to paycheck because um, they have money and they pay their bills and they're like, I don't feel like I'm paycheck to paycheck. I realized what was making me feel bad. Like you and, felt your gut hurt. Yeah, really, like, has, like I used to think that money was completely about dollars and cents and paycheck X versus bills. You're rich, you're happy, you're poor, you're not happy. But it's not, it's, it's how money makes you feel. And I've really learned that some people can have a big mortgage and they invest lots of money and they're very comfortable with it. Other people would be the most comfortable if they didn't have a mortgage payment at all and they had some money in the bank. Um, other people uh, want to have no monthly payments and they can earn a little bit. Um, everyone has their own comfort level of what makes them feel good about money. And I would say to anyone listening, if you're, if you're looking at your money situation and, you, and it makes you feel uncomfortable, you can change it. You're completely in control of it. And that's really what I decided is like, I'm not going to do it anymore. So what I was doing, like literally here's my personal financial plan. My paycheck would come. I'd have literally a stack of bills. This was back when everything came in the mail. Mm -hmm. I would go through them and, and prioritize every other Friday. Here's the bill, here's the amount, here's the due date. What can I pay with this paycheck? What am I gonna push to two weeks? 
what has to be, what do I have to think about? Do I have a kid's birthday or a vacation or something where I have to save, have, have money for? Um, and it's like, I'm getting my paycheck and it's stressing me out every single time that I get a paycheck. I'm like, I'm so stressed out, I'm not gonna be able to pay everything in my stack. Um, so I'd shuffle them to the next week and then I'd feel bad for two weeks. So, you know what, what really re resonates with me is that feeling of such stress that's with you all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're saying, okay, the paycheck comes, but in the back of your mind, it's a constant, there's a stack over there I have not addressed yet. Yes, yes, and that's what I, that's what got me to change is I realized what was making me feel uncomfortable 24-7, 365 days. It's like I never felt comfortable with money and I'm like, I'm going to do it differently. And fortunately, I had every tool. I worked at a financial institution that has every tool and I knew everything. I just had to decide to do it. And the day I decided to do it, everything got better. That was maybe 15 years ago and I live a completely different financial life than I did then and I make a little bit more money. So people who are just now thinking, okay, I made it through the pandemic, I'm making it through the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, and now I see, oh, I, all the student loan bills are going to start uh, yep. again. All the, you know, yeah. what's, what's what going you, on? Yeah, what do you do? Um, I tell you what I, what I, what I did is, is what I thought would make me feel most comfortable was to, to take control of my paycheck and decide. I felt like my, my bills were telling me what was happening with my paycheck. And I'm like, I need to change that. I want to be in control of my paycheck and I want to have a bigger cushion. I want to have more money in reserve so I so when the next thing comes, I, I have a reserve. So those were the, the two things that I knew were going to make me feel better. And I decided that my finances were going to be, uh, were going to be about making me feel better and then I could work on it from there. So, um, you know, I, we kind of follow the Dave Ramsey rule is you, you know, you, you, you have to budget your bills. So the very first thing I did was like, man, let's, I, I need to make my mortgage payment on time, right? We all need to make our mortgage payment on time. It's, you get to keep your house, um, you get to improve your credit score, you get to pay down your, all those good things happen when you pay it, when you pay it on time. So having a part of a stack of bills every month was the wrong thing to do. So, you know, the first thing I did was set that up on automatic payments, you know, on my, my paycheck comes in with direct deposit. It's always there, so I set up automatic payments. I'd save half of my mortgage from my first check and half of my mortgage payment from my second check, and then I'd have an automatic bill pay that paid my mortgage every month. And really what I do is I just kind of set it up so it, my money automatically came in and paid that bill. And I wrote down all of my other bills, and then I did that with each, each one of my bills. I'm like, okay, it's, I get a paycheck on the 15th and the 30th, my mortgage is on the 2nd, my car payment's on the 10th, um, and I, just started to put all of those in there. And once I had written down everything that I owed and all the money that was going on. Was out, that surprising? It was terrifying and made me sick to my stomach that 80% of my paycheck was gone before my money even came. But it was a great realization too because I had a list of my bills and how much I had to pay every month and how much I owed on them. They're being, I'm like, all right, I'm wiping these things out. Um, you know, I get a tax return every year and in, instead of deciding to keep up with the Joneses, we decided we were getting rid of that debt because it was going to make me feel better in two ways. I'm going to have more money to save and I have less money going out the door. That's going to make me feel better. And by setting it up on automatic payments, I didn't have to think about it every payday. Um, and every time I paid something off, I got more money to spend so it, so it made me feel better. So when you, this is what, what we often refer to as a snowball, right? Yep, yep. And you can do snowball um, payments that are Basically, you take the, the highest payment maybe that you have, mm -hmm. um, the highest amount that you owe, mm -hmm. uh, and you pay that one first, and then you go to the next, and then you go to the next, where you're putting more money towards it, not just the minimum amount, right? Yep. Yep. But then there's the other um, avenue of looking at what the interest rate that you're paying. Yep. And, and how important is that? Yeah, that's what, I mean, really, I just made a simple Excel spreadsheet that had the debt, how much I owed, what the interest rate was, and what the payment was. And like I, I'm a feeling person with finances, and I think you should be too. So I looked at it and I said, I want to pay off the one with the highest interest rate first. Someone else might look at it and say, I want to pay the one with the highest monthly or the lowest monthly payment first. I just want to get one knocked off and feel good about. So whichever one makes you feel better, if you're paying off debt, either way, you're already in a win situation by, by just deciding to do that. What happens if all of a sudden you realize, I, I, I don't have enough money? I really have gotten myself into a situation where my debt load is so high 
and I did try to keep up with my neighbor. Uh huh. And now all of a sudden I woke up. It sounds to me like you were close to that. Yeah, uh, you, I was, and and here's what I did. Um, I had bought a brand new car in 1996 because I had a sales job and I thought I was rich and I could afford it, a $700 payment when I made $28,000 a year. Um, I sold that car. I had to take a loss on it, but I did it. And then I bought a car for $1,500 with cash. That really, and now that really makes me feel better. And I hate spending money on cars. Sorry if you're a car lover, but you know, my wife, who is a professional, who drives a 13 year old car and I drive a 15 year old car because I, I dislike that car payment so much. And something that takes $600 a month or $700 a month out of your paycheck when you're stressed out anyway is awful. So yeah, tip number three, don't keep up with the Joneses. I have friends with brand new Teslas that look really nice and beautiful and wonderful and um, we're still going to hold on because to me it feels better to have that money in the bank and feel comfortable and not have debt as, as opposed to having the debt. Pandemic hits, there's emergency savings that people automatically start to talk about. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it used to be that we would say, you know what, if you could have three months of your savings in your emergency savings account. Mm -hmm. uh, that that was really good. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the pandemic hits and everybody realizes three months is nothing mm -hmm. in the term of savings. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would always say start with trying to get one month because if you're like I was before I decided to make a change, like, oh my gosh, I, six months worth of savings seems like forever away. Um, chip away at it. And what I did was when I started paying down debt, I took one of those $50 a month payments and I started putting it into a savings. So I was still spending the same amount of money, but I was putting over in savings. And a lot of people are like, what are saving? What is it for? What's it? Why is it sitting there? My 20 year old daughter, why is money sitting there? Um, and it's just for things like you would never think of, like whoever thought in 2019 that we would, could all be idle for, for this long. So just having it there. For me, I have a, a, a savings that's more than six months of my salary and it just feels good. That's the only reason I have it is I have that safety net and every night when I go to bed, it, it feels good to me. And so that's why I have it. The other thing I think that people um, get confused about and you see so many commercials now about credit score and how important your credit score is mm -hmm. and, uh, and that you really want to make sure that you're looking at it. Uh, most financial institutions, I know consumers has it, where you get it for free, you can mm -hmm. take a look at it whenever you want to, every day if you wanted to. Yep. Um, but it really does make an impact on your savings and on your well-being. Sure. Well, first of all, it feels good to have a great credit score. And if you have one, you should tell everybody about it. I don't know why people want to keep it secret. If it's bad, say, I have a bad credit score. It's not like you're stuck with it. Uh, you know, you can, you can change it, especially your banker. Tell them, you're like, I want to get a better credit score. We can help you with it. Um, but having a great, I mean, we just refinanced our mortgage. And so having a, you know, if you have an excellent credit, you get the best rate. And, for, and when I looked at it, where excellent credit today, you get a really low rate. Good credit, you have a pretty low rate. But that could be $200 a month difference for having a slightly higher credit score, um, which doesn't take a whole lot to do if you're paying attention to it and, and it means something to you. So, um, and it decided, and I've had a credit score, I had a 590 credit score one time uh, when I was in college, I remember seeing it, and I just checked it the other day and it was 796. So I've been everywhere and, um, and, and anyone you can decide, you can take control of it. And I really, it is that control that really helps you feel better and decide that you're, you're gonna do something about it. When you now go to companies and you talk to employees, uh, you must meet people from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me what it is that you find the most interesting. Is, is there something that keeps coming up over and over again when people finally feel like, I, I want to talk to you about what I'm going through? Mm -hmm. We do tons of seminars. Sometimes you'll, you'll get people who will stand up and literally just spill their life story. Um, and that's usually a good thing. When someone says, I got a car repossessed and I had my house foreclosed upon, everyone else in the room feels better because that's, you know, like, well, I just had three late payments on my credit card and I have a bad credit score or whatever it is. So I think it is getting that out of there. Like you always assume we live in the banking world that all of our counterparts have great credit score and, you know, don't owe a lot of money or any of that thing. It's all assumptions. No one's perfect. No one has it figured out. Um, if they do, they're probably like me and then for a while they didn't have it figured out. So if you say, 
you know, I, may, I messed this up and I missed these payments. You're like, oh yeah, that happens. Let's solve it and, and make it better. So um, learning and then, and then taking control and saying, I want a better credit score. Is that something that you find challenging that people still have the reticence of talking about their money? A hundred percent. Yeah, it is like the one of the biggest taboos in America, right? Like, Lynn, how much do you make? You're like, well, I'm not. I'm not telling you. Yeah, you're, no one's telling anybody, right? It's not like, your business. Yeah, how much did your car cost? <laughs> but uh, yeah, you, it's it's taboo to talk about it, um, but you also feel obligated to to outdo everyone. Um, you know, I, I pull into the parking lot at work. I probably have one of the oldest cars there. I have a 2007 car. So, um, and you're like, oh, man, I should... Maybe I should be driving in a, a nicer car than a brand new teller that we just hired two weeks ago. Uh, like you should, I should be doing that and putting that in your own mind and trying to force yourself. You look at your neighbors and you always pick the very best thing. Like, like oh, well, they have a new car, I should have a new car. And then your other neighbor gets a new boat. And you're like, well, they have a new boat, I should have a new boat. Um, and it's impossible to, to keep up with the Joneses and probably won't make you happy in the long run if you like to have keep some of your money. You know, I love the fact that uh, many times, because we work in a financial institution, there's times that we might have a great savings rate for, for members or for people in the community. And it always makes me grin um, because uh, when people have their savings in order, um, it often is the individual that you that walks in and they're not driving the best car, mm -hmm. and but they really are proud of the fact that they have money they can invest. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the next step after after you get yourself out of debt is mm -hmm. that you can literally start to make money on your money. Yeah, which also feels good. You know, once you, um, you know, if you're at a point at your employer, like, man, I should be contributing to my 401k, but I'm not there right now. I was, I was there. I'm like, my dad is just trying to hit me over the head with a baseball <laughs> bat. Um, but I was like, no, I need this money. I got to go party on Friday nights. I can't be putting it in my 401k. Um, but yeah, the comfort level you get, because you know we have to take care of ourselves uh, when we retire. We, we should not be counting on the government or anyone else really to be there to take care of us. We should be counting on ourselves um, and putting that money away and having it um, and knowing that every paycheck you're putting money away for retirement also makes you feel good. And then when you're, you know, when you're doing your mortgage application, they're asking about your assets and you're like, well, I have this 401k that, oh my gosh, after 15 years of consumer's credit union, it's a pretty sizable amount. Man, I hardly even felt any pain putting it away, and now it's this, this giant number, and then you feel, obviously, a sense of pride, and you feel good about that. So getting, getting started down that road just really makes people feel better. And I love the fact that you just talked about you didn't even feel it. And so you, you spoke a little bit, and let's dig into this, about how you can use technology, or maybe it's not technology. Maybe you're still you know really wanting to make sure that you have physical you know, money, mm -hmm. you know, you know where that money is and you walk in and you talk to someone every single week, perhaps. Yep. But there is technology that allows you to take money and place it into a savings that you don't see. Yep. And you, you just totally forget about it. Yeah, we help members all the time with, um, it's just a, a savings account. It's like the envelope system that you might use to, you know, put money away for retirement, money away for your car payment, money away to buy a new car. Um, but we do the same thing digitally and say, hey, if your paycheck's coming in and you want to save $100 per, per paycheck, we can move it over into a separate account. It can sit there and you can let it grow. You don't even see it if you um, go look at the ATM and use your debit card. You, your balance doesn't show that, and so you're not tempted to spend it because it's not there. So, yeah, setting it up, and that, Lynn, that is what worked for me is setting it and forgetting it, just letting it go. Like. Once your paycheck comes in and the money that needs to go out to pay your bills goes out, your 401k is money's out. After your second direct deposit of that that amount of money, you get used to it. Like you're like, oh yeah, this is how much I have to spend. Um, Versus thinking, oh, but there's all this over here I could use, right? You're saying, yes, no, I don't even see it. Right, I don't. I don't see it. It's there. It handles itself. I haven't looked at a mortgage payment in two years. It just it just takes care of itself. Um, and it makes my, I don't have to make a decision every other Friday on what to do with my money. My big decisions are pay all my bills exactly on time, take the rest of the money, invest of it, have fun with what's mine. I just want to know what it is. So that's what really makes me feel good now. Like really not being paycheck to paycheck, which is where I am now. We get paid every other Friday. I do not know which Friday it is because it doesn't matter to me. I have a savings account and my spending accounts over here and it has money in it. So 
and it feels really good to not to know. And that's my, that's my ideal for everyone that I work with, is if you can get to the point where you have everything set up, everything's working great, you don't even know when payday is because it, it doesn't affect you, you are not paycheck to paycheck, and you probably feel a lot better about yourself. You're probably a better employee and a better parent and a better person in the community. Well, and I do think that that's one of the things that you talk about, right? Of, of anybody who owns a business and you have employees, if they are feeling stressed about money, their productivity is not as high. Yeah. We know that. There's proof on that. And um, and if you're if if someone comes to you like today and do do you sit down with them to show them okay this is what we need to do mm -hmm. it's as easy as a piece of paper let's get to it yeah we I would say according to some national studies about seventy eight percent of employees are really paycheck to paycheck meaning if their next paycheck doesn't come in there's seventy eight percent seventy eight percent yeah so if you're a business owner most of your employees most of the people that work with us at consumers need that next paycheck or else something bad is going to happen to their life. Um, so yeah, we are, we don't say hypothetically you should set up a nice little budget and pay all your bills on time. That's great, uh, but that doesn't work. We say really, here's your paycheck. Here's the day that your rent's due. When your paycheck comes in, your, your rent's a thousand dollars. Let's take 500 from the first paycheck, 500 from the second paycheck. We'll set it up so it just moves over automatically. And then we'll have an automatic payment on the first of the month. We'll pay your rent for you. So you're on auto payment. Money comes in, gets moved over, pay your rent. And that's how we can start to put someone in control. And re that's really how you start with your financial planning is to get some level of control somewhere. So that allows you to do that and say, I got it. I am now in control of my housing payment. I see how it goes. I don't have any more money to buy Mountain Dew and cigarettes, but shoot, uh, at least my, my housing payments begin made on time. Um, and then we just build on that. All right, what's your next most important payment that you have to pay every month that affects your credit score? You build yourself into these habits, you get used to it, um, and then once you get everything in there, then all you do is pay off debts and you get, you get a pay raise then. Because once you pay off a debt, you get more money for yourself. So uh, you get to give yourself pay raises and really it's the amount of money you keep which is yours, right? So um, if all the money goes out the door, that's, that's no good. So we really start with people Hands on, this is exactly how you do it. Let's start with one bill. Does this feel good to you to have this set up automatically? Yep, all right, let's repeat it with another one. So the overwhelmingness of debt, the overwhelmingness of living where you're feeling like you're financially strapped and you have no one to turn to, truly can be as simple as let's start. Let's, yep, yeah, we start one thing. You, could, you might look at it, you write down all your bills, Lynn, and you might say, oh, I have a, crazy car payment at a crazy interest rate uh, and it's a crazy economy today I could go trade this in for a car that cost one quarter as much have no car you, you might decide to do that but starting writing down everything that you have and what you owe and how you're gonna pay it can really open your eyes and say oh my gosh this is dumb for me to have this car payment I could get I could get rid of it or this stupid little credit card I'm paying this off with my as soon as I get my tax return and the rest of it's going to that but taking Getting, starting to take control um, helps you feel in control and then you, you can take more control. Now tell us a little bit about family because a lot of time, you talked about your dad a lot, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're married. Yep. Uh, when you're in the situation where you're, you're strapped for cash and the communication isn't good, mm -hmm. that leads to such stress in marriages. Yeah. Uh, how do you help others when you're when you're talking with them? And maybe there's an instance with you too that yeah. it was like, oh my goodness, we we have to be open with each other. Yeah, be open and don't be afraid. Walk in to consumers and be like, here's our troubles. Uh, tell you know, because if you're not a if you're not a financial expert, how you know if we're a couple, how do I say, oh, this is the better way to do it, and you say that's the better way to do it, and you look at each other and go, we really don't know what the better way to do. And if someone else is saying, here's what you guys really should do. Um, you don't have to argue with each other. You're, you're just w letting that person say, I can help you out. From a third person's perspective, you as a couple have all these emotions and, and uh, that's your debt and that's your debt. So you should pay, whatever that is, sometimes having a third party can say, can look at it with just logic and say, you could start like this. And then, it is and then dollars move from there. and cents, it's, mo it's numbers. It is, it is money. It is impossible for people that own the money not to get their emotions involved in it though. and and. And, and argue about it. And so that, that's another great thing is how do you not argue about money? My only tip, I'll give my only um, tip for couples is 
um, and I learned this from someone else, it wasn't my idea, is that we had all of our accounts set up to spend all our bills, and then we both had a spending account of an equal amount, which, which at the time I wasn't so sure about because I made quite a bit more than, than my wife did. But now that she makes more than I do, I'm really happy that we have equal spending accounts because we feel like equals, and uh, you and your spouse should probably, probably feel like equals. So that, that's my only advice is if you have equal spending accounts and then uh, I can go buy the dumb things that she doesn't think we should buy as a couple and that it's my spending money and she can go do it with hers. If you're spending both your monies to, you know, to buy $300 jeans with diamond studs in them, then maybe not, both people won't be happy. So. Well, and it, it's back to emotion again, isn't it? It's, it, got, it Which to is me, what you started it always at. comes back to emotion is think about money in dollars and cents and logic, but then add your emotion to it because that's what's going to matter to you. If your finances are logically figured out, but you feel emotional stress about them, you do not have a good plan. If you have a good plan that makes you feel good, then, then you have a good plan. Well, and I love the fact that you're saying, okay, it's okay. If there's if if that statistic is even half right, yeah, then so many people should just be open about talking right. about it. You're looking at your neighbors. And you're like, they must have bought that Tesla with cash. They probably don't even have a mortgage on their house, and they're they're sweating it out because they owe every single penny that they have. Um, and you look like the poor guy, but you've got money in the bank and you sleep well every night. Um, you know, it's it really is trying having that mental. Um, drive to say I'm, I'm going to do what's right for me and makes me feel good instead of trying to keep keep up with the Joneses that can uh, help you sleep better at night. So tell us, uh, wrap it up with uh, what are the top three things that you feel like at a different stages of your life? Mm -hmm. um, college you started off with and the minute you're all of a sudden getting free money handed over yeah. hand and fist. Yes. Um, yeah, I would say don't spend money when you don't have it, when you're young. That's, that's the problem with young people. You, don't, you get your first job and you don't have a lot of money. You think you do, but you rent an apartment. Don't spend money when you don't have it. That probably goes for your, for your whole life. Avoid debt without a purpose. If you own a home, that's great. If the debt is for a car, just enough of a car to accomplish, to use it as a tool and it's getting you back to work, that's good debt to have. So don't be afraid of that. Be afraid of buying a $900 TV on a credit card when you can't pay it off at the end of the month. Learn that lesson from me and, and don't do that. So, um, yeah, so don't spend more than you have. Don't go into debt and do not try to keep up with the Joneses because you don't know their whole story. They're, they are, they, they're showing you the very, you're only seeing the very best side of the Joneses. You don't, you don't see their back office. So you just gave us some don'ts. How about some do's? Do's. Feel good about your money. Enjoy payday. You're, get, you're at work, you're getting paid every Friday. Um, enjoy it. Make sure that it, it's working fine for you. Set it and forget it. If you pay a bill every single month at your mortgage payment, you're gonna, don't write 360 checks to your mortgage company. Set it and forget it. Make sure the stressful part of your finances are set and they're gone and you don't have to worry about it. Um, do try to save. Max out your 401k. The first thing, that's what um, I did my very first day at Consumers Credit Union. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to max it out, get the max match that we have. Um, and boy, 10 years flies by, doesn't it? And the next thing sure you know, does. you're, uh, um, you're in a, an extremely different place. And the third thing is time flies. If you have a terrible credit score today, time flies. Two years from now is going to be in a minute, and, and anyone can go from a bad credit score to a good credit score in two years. I mean, that's the outside. So you think about two years ago before you know any of this started, it was, it was just then, and it'll, two years from now will be just then, um, and you can be in control and take it. So, so feel good about your finances. Even if you don't like where you're at, you can get a plan, you can feel better about it, and, and tomorrow can be, can be a better day than today. And how about do reach out for help? Yeah, for sure. Don't do it yourself. I mean, yeah, there's lots of experts out there. Um, whatever you're an expert in, do that, and then, then come find help with your finances. It's not tough. Um, we want you to feel good about it. So if you come see us, know that we're, we want people to feel good about their finances. So you'll walk out feeling better than you walked in, even if you, you know, have more debt than you thought you had. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Consumers Credit Union is so proud to have really partnered uh, to make sure that the Cascade Community Foundation could put together something that really focuses on stuff that, you know what, I think it used to be taboo and people need to start opening it up. And we really appreciate your talk today. Oh, it's been my pleasure.
A brave story to share, Scott's program, Consumers at Work, provides new hire onboarding assistance and financial wellness opportunities to area business clients. One of the benefits of Consumers at Work program is the assurance that all employees have easy access to the standard bank account to eliminate the need for a paper paycheck, uh, which ben benefits those struggling to qualify for a bank account while also reducing the workload of payroll staff. Uh, Fred, we heard Scott talk specifically about uh, gra grabbing on to something that was going to help him kind of get out and establish some debt. And then he went right into, uh, he got a credit card and bought a TV. Uh, is this something that you see a lot maybe for somebody in, in, in their 20s or just getting out of college, just trying to catch up and, and uh, get into life as fast as they can and go out and buy a TV? Yeah, yeah, many, many times somebody uh, uh, younger for sure, that, uh, that sense of urgency needing maybe to establish themselves or get placed and say, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go buy this material possession and an easy way to do that is with a credit card. Yeah, sure. And, and reconciling a bank account. I remember my first time getting a bank account, having no idea. This is back when you had to do it by paper, but uh, cer certainly something of, a, of you need to be exposed to it at an early age to get the handle of what it means to keep your bank, bank account reconciled. Something that seems very simple to maybe us, but isn't always the case, is that right? 100%, we start with most clients um, in, in asking who's reconciling your bank account. And it can very often just be a blank stare. Who's we, what do you mean who's reconciling the bank account? But that's your check, that's your test to make sure that you're on track, that what happened and what you thought happened did happen. And times have changed, it is the, the paper method is not taught as often. And even in our personal households, the use of a simple software sometimes makes that very simple to still reconcile their accounts. Yeah, sure. And I think almost every household or business is going to be using some sort of electronic version of Absolutely. this. Uh, and, and coming into that space now more and more, uh, which can probably help pr uh, create anxieties, is we're getting bombarded with, hey, your, your credit score is now available here, or your credit score is now available there. Uh, it's something that the software programs and even on, uh, on phone apps are alerting us to, but if you're in a situation where you're trying to kind of ignore this problem, you're setting it aside, Scott talks about the stack of bills that he would have and set them aside, um, you may not recognize these alerts that you're getting about your new credit score as actually being something of a benefit to you to help you create better wealth in the long run. Sure, the, the value of the credit score is, is huge, um, n not even in the, in the financial world. And those little reminders are, are, good, are good things to pay attention to. You may see a, a, a one point change, a two point change, um, a, a small change, which is helping to your benefit. And it's not just financial, the ability to finance something or use debt in the right way. Um, your, your auto insurance, your insurance score, your the cost of insurance is tied to your credit score. Yeah. The value of the credit score has a huge impact across many things that we do. And hard to establish at a young age, is that still the case? I know it was for me, I had to get a credit card just to start establishing some form of credit. It is. Um, other ways to start establishing some credit is a, a small, simple credit card. A prepaid credit card will always help establish a credit score. Um, cell phones, utility bills. So, so moving out on your own, if you're at a college campus and you're renting an apartment, having that utility bill in your name may help establish a little bit of credit score. Yeah, let's tackle this a little bit because I like where we're going. If you're a parent at home, um, and maybe you haven't been so attuned uh, with having a household budget that your children, who are now maybe growing into adulthood, uh, would, would benefit from. Uh, maybe it's something as simple to help them establish credit. You're turning the cell phone bill over to them and having them establish it themselves as a tool. 100%. I imagine most families are probably charging their child a small amount for their cell phone. Yeah. So simply having that cell phone in their name um, will certainly help in, in that area for, for sure. And we find many of those families, um, the, the children that are at school, sometimes the parents haven't done well budgeting. So we'll sit with both, um, teaching both at the same time the importance. If, if we can teach the leader in somebody's life the importance of the financial control, then they'll see it as well. Yeah, and there's uh, abs absolutely a lot of self-help and uh, podcasts and video casts, uh, uh, opportunities for people to watch to get just more acquainted with what that looks like. Um, in episode one of, of this season, we talked with a number of experts as well, just to, just to help our viewers understand some of those processes. One of them that came on uh, really talked about establishing at a young age, uh, just the concepts of your giving, your saving, and your spending, 
uh, in in alignment every month. They they yeah. sit down and talk about that. Um, do you come across clients, fam, you know, people, fa yeah. family based clients, where they're struggling to even understand the concept of what a home budget looks like? Absolutely. Yeah, very, very often. And if somebody's in trouble, that's usually the first things we're asking for is if we can help them to talk about their budget or start to look at breaking the, the cost into what's already a fixed cost, what's some of the variable costs within their, within their home and family budget. And yeah, the old envelope system is what most of us started using. And now that's been automated. Um, so we, we teach a lot of that kind of that bucket savings plan or taking um, separate bank accounts. Um, many payroll systems now, in, in when payroll was first direct deposit, maybe it was one or two accounts. Many are 10, 10 different accounts. Yeah. So trying to save for next year's vacation ahead of time or, or trying to get out of debt on one, on one item you're focusing on and kind of eliminating that from your, your general fund of a, of a household. Sure. Which is no different than a business, kind of just eliminating that and, and, and keeping the general fund available for the day-to-day -day activities for your family. Yeah, and I know for you guys at Pinnell CPA, you know, one of the things that you really try to instill is you don't want clients coming to you asking you for help you want them coming to you six months or a year prior and asking for advice because then you're going to help curb the, the potential impact of the problem that might be pending yeah the the emotions are different when you come in looking for a plan um, certainly if you're in a if you're in a spot of need and you're in trouble the only way to get out of that is a plan and we definitely encourage when things are when things are tough you need a plan to work your way out of that that spot and we'll help you with that but don't, but don't let that stop. Even when things are good, I mean, a plan, a plan is helpful in, in, in any of those cases. So advising and setting some boundaries in place, setting some processes in place to simplify and automate your, your entire home financial system. And um, Scott talked about that a little bit in the evolution of the different bank accounts and saving things and opening accounts and the automatic transfer between accounts. Super useful tools. Yeah, so it's using modern conveniences and technologies to set yourself up for success in a, in a financial world. Uh, I know for you too, you get to talking more about planning ahead and saving ahead. I can, I can only imagine what it's like for some families that are living paycheck to paycheck the idea of saving and planning ahead is like, <laughs> yeah, man, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, but there are tools that are available to us, even if it's just rounding up every, uh, every time we make an expenditure, rounding up and that kicks into a, a savings account. Yep. Talk a little bit about that because these families still want to enjoy a vacation. They still want to uh, get out and uh, enjoy life and, and are going to need available funding for that. And there's some tools that they can incorporate. Yeah, we, we personally do this and we have for a long time, even a small amount, if it's $10, $5, um, a paycheck that goes into a separate account. Um, and maybe that's your, um, we were always advised, you know, as a young couple, we needed to have a, a, a weekly meal together outside of the household. That was really hard to afford. But if every paycheck you put $5 into a separate account or into an envelope and you can't touch it, get, give it to somebody else that you're, you're sharing a, an apartment with. Hey, you hold on to this for me so that next week I've, I know I can do that one thing. And that little, those little amounts you won't miss. You find yeah. that the rounding up, the, the rounding, the, at the end of the year, your paycheck is a certain amount and kind of rounding it down to something and putting the extra over here, you'll eventually start to forget about that and you won't see it there. And, and once you get to a certain point, and, and Scott alludes to this too, like suddenly he's got tiers of priority. Yes. Um, here are the ones that I absolutely need to get taken care of. Um, and then you get the snowball effect, right? Like now you've paid off these four bills. Well, that's 600 bucks a month that you were dedicated to that. Now snowball into your other less higher priority bills and you're starting to really pay things off. But the beauty of it is that when you start forecasting the future, you're getting to see, hey, at some point I'm going to have $800 a month extra for discretionary spending. Yeah, I loved how Scott talked about time because it goes fast. I think he talked about in a couple of years you don't even realize what happened. Yeah. And there is some sacrifices to, to get out, to get your plan started. There'll be some sacrifices to get where you need to go. And you'll, you'll feel the anxiety and stress will slowly disappear. You'll have a plan. You'll be knocking away at things, and you'll you'll set yourself up for success right away. So you knock out that first one, and automatically, will the plan will be to just, just, just start on the next one. You'll already know. Kind of set that annual plan. By the end of this year, this will be done. By the end of next year, this will be done. And you set it, and you forget it, and you stay focused on what your priorities are. Yeah, he also alludes to, and and Lynn does a good job of kind of drawing this out of Scott in in the segment. He alludes to 
the 401k and, and the commitment that, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm committing to the maximum of my 401k. So what that match is that his employer is providing. Uh, there's kind of two, two parts to this. One, do it. You got to get going yeah. in there. Uh, and two, you guys don't really see uh, financial savings for your future, retirement savings as a savings account. It's kind of like if you put it in there, you can't touch that. That's there forever until you need it when you're older. Yeah, those are the, that's the last place. Once it's there, it's there. We don't like to look at that bucket. It's there. Just pretend it's not there. Yeah. Let it grow, do its thing. But yeah, that, that's super important to get in even at the, at the amount that your employer provides the biggest benefit. There's, there's, some, there's some current year income tax savings if you're trying to save some dollars to pay off some debt. Um, there's, there's some tax savings to fund the 401k and then working your way, to, like Scott said, to maximizing that amount. Um, you will, when we talk to young college students, even high school students with jobs that are funding those, you always hear, you're going to, you're going to be so thankful that that's there 20, 30 years from now. How scary is a 401k for a first time, for a client that might be for the first time talking about contributing to a 401k? In, from your, when you see it in their eyes, do you sense fear at times uh, when they're talking about, I mean, do they feel like they're taking a leap of faith? I don't see that they're seeing a, a, a leap of faith. It's, uh, it's encouraging. They, it is with the young college graduates that might land a job, they might send us that first set of paperwork, what do I do? And, and the ones that know us, they know, yep, 6%, 10%, what, that's going in the 401k. Mm -hmm. And we've worked with them to let them, to let them know that. Um, I think they see it as encouragement. Um, it's an opportunity where there'll be something there for me in the future. And, and then it's, it just happens. And then their lifestyle then is maintained with what they have left after they funded that. And they're building a great and fantastic nest egg. Yeah, and you get in a lot with corporate accounting, uh, working with business owners, small, small and large. Um, one of the programs that Consumers talks about a lot is this at work program where they can come into a business setting and help to establish uh, resources for their employees. So it kind of becomes a benefit to the employees. One of the things that I found really interesting about it, Fred, is that I didn't know this, but it can be difficult for some for some people to qualify for just something as basic as having a checking account, and they help alleviate that. Uh, do you do you guys run into this, or what's what's your sense on that, and and just in the industry at large? Yeah, we do see some um, either people maybe don't want a bank account, so there's still some there's still that fear of banking once in a while, and there's some alternatives around prepaid debit cards so that people can maintain um, what they need to do to to take their paycheck. But making it easy, an employer kind of sponsoring for their employees to make it easy to get a bank account. Um, we, we require any of the client, the business clients we work with, that their employees all have a bank account. Yeah. And if there's no way to do that, we can reach out to companies like consumers and say, can you help with the cash management of this client to encourage their employees? And they'll do the education to explain it and help them open the accounts. But the way the world is going, you need somewhere to put your paycheck. Yeah. And, and better yet, have multiple accounts to put your paycheck to. Yeah, per, per capita in the area that we serve, Cascade, Ada, Forest Hills, in, in, on, the, on the west side of Grand Rapids, or on the west side of uh, Michigan, uh, per capita more business owners than really anywhere else you're going to find in the country, uh, which brings this whole new element into this, right? You've got entrepreneurs, you've got people who have taken on maybe family businesses, uh, passed on from, from generation to generation. Uh, give a sense to our viewers that might be thinking about, hey, I'm going to either take over this business from my parents or I'm, I'm looking to start this business. What are, from a financial perspective, some of the first steps you need to take before even diving into setting up you know, the actual structure of the business? Yeah, that's, um, we've, we've, all of our entrepreneurs have been through this. Um, the idea of, we, we focus hard on cash flow. That's our biggest focus for our new clients, our new business owners. If you're a small business owner to a very large business owner, what is your business gonna to do to generate cash? After you've bought your materials, collected from your customers, paid your employees, where it's, then you have the cash. And now we're right back to the same thing we talk about the family buckets. And we, and we create those buckets. We need a, a bucket over here for taxes. I mean, a business owner doesn't have to pay their taxes every two weeks in their paycheck. So, but we can't forget about taxes. Uh, we may need to pay off debt. Maybe we borrowed some money to buy a piece of machinery to make parts to sell. 
Well, how are we going to do that? Where's the cash flow going to come from that? So that's the biggest reminder in entrepreneurs is the bank fills up with cash, but there might be a need for that. And we just like to set the expectation right away. Here it is. Here's your paycheck. Here's your profit distribution. You're going to pay your employees. And if you hit these numbers and metrics, great. As things fall below, we start to help with that plan. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's margins in, in anything, whether you're selling a widget or providing anything. a service. Absolutely. Uh, but I think sometimes the trap can be for entrepreneurs of, you know, hey, we can charge this amount for it. Well, what's your cost built into that charge? Yeah, our young entrepreneurs, um, and uh, Jennifer and I did the same thing when we started our business, is, uh, man, when we, um, you've got this, you got this business bank behind you, a business bank account, but to separate our personal lives 100%. This, this, is, this is at home, this is business. Because things can change drastically at both places if you start to commingle or forget what's going on. So we put tools, processes, systems, software in place to kind of help separate that and really just stick with the plan. Yeah, in, in uh, the previous episode to this one, um, we talk a lot about the fluid line between being a family business owner and having and you know managing your family. Um, I, I come from... Uh, my wife's family, who's a family business owner, and they've lived it their whole life. They they don't. It's hard to really tell the difference between where the business stops and the actual family begins. This is where traps of, of financial problems can can really leach in there. And now all of a sudden, the conversation is being had on the couch yes. rather than in a conference room. Um, with the family comes all this overwhelming portion of emotion because these are loved ones. These are people that you're taking care of. Uh, from a family business perspective, what can those that maybe m might be taking over a family business or hope to pass on uh, one day, you know, what are some of the areas that they should be focusing on as well that might be different from a personal bank account or if you're coming in and, and starting a franchise, you know, that doesn't may maybe doesn't have a family business component to it? Yeah, um, communication is going to be number one. Um, around finances, especially if you're a generation starting to take over another family business or if you're part of that family business, but having clear communication around the finan finances, for sure, within the business and then at home. If you have a young couple that's coming in to take over the family business, what is the expectation? Um, what, maybe not even how the family runs, but for you and your family. Um, we see that a lot as well. This is you and your family kind of joining the family business. Yeah. What does that mean? And a lot, a lot of times, there's it's a taboo to talk about. Yeah. Um, we help, we do, we run a lot of those meetings to help explain that to, to the to the gen to the different generations of what that means. And you may have um, spouses that are, are are coming with you, right? Your partner's coming with you as you're joining your family business. What does that mean? And we try to kind of set some boundaries again around that to kind of keep things separate. Um, and then hold, and then as everybody's accountable. And then, again, there's still a plan. There's yeah. kind of, but we have a plan to to merge you into the business and then what those financials uh, struggles or pros might be. Yeah, and, and I think what Scott brings us home with in his conversation with Lynn is ultimately something that seems so obvious, but again, can be so difficult to live by, is don't spend what you don't have. And we, we live in a society that has trillions of dollars in debt. Um, yeah. it's, it's become kind of an, an American a custom, a custom, maybe even a global custom, um, but don't spend what, what you don't have. But in, in our conversation before the cameras were turned on, sometimes you are in a situation where you might not have it, but you need to get a credit card in order to get started in your job. Maybe your job requires something that you need. Go into a little bit of that. Yeah, the um, debt is a tool. Um, individually or for a business, you I mean, certainly you, you don't need to spend what you don't have. Um, yeah, my example, I mean, you need, you need to buy something in order to get started in your career. Um, you're, we're, we're in a studio, you need, you need equipment, you're, you're going to start this studio. You, you, go, you might need to borrow on that. Um, in my case, I needed to buy some sports coats and some suits. I was starting a professional career. I, it, was, it was required. But I didn't have the cash to do that. But I knew over a 12-month period of 12 paychecks, I'd be done, invested, and on a plan. And yeah. so the use of debt in the right way can certainly be a tool to capitalize and build on. Um, the, the idea of going on vacation on some debt, that doesn't work in our plans. Yeah. Um, that's where we're using the bucket systems to get, get on a plan, get out of our challenges, and then start to think about what the future can offer and start saving for that ahead of time. 
Yeah, I think it's, it, it, we're, we're in a society now where we're more and more accustomed to talking about the mental health components of really anything in our life. Uh, one of the bi biggest statistics that we come across is how many people uh, identify money, uh, whether that's a budgeting for the family or something as simple as remembering math in high school, but they immediately have anxiety about that. Coming from your perspective, when you have uh, a prospective client coming online um, and you have a sales team that's helping to bring them in and then you've got an account person that's actually looking at their books, how much are you guys needing to prepare your business and your staff for understanding that there are complexities uh, that are human nature and anxiety and mental health is gonna be one of those? Yeah, we, um, we call it life events sometimes where we maybe get into discussions or conversations with business owners or, or families of all sizes in where we can help or what they're challenging with. Um, and, and most of, of course in our industry it's usually around the financials. Um, many times if a, if a couple is struggling or a business is struggling, they don't know what questions to ask. They may come to us and so we're kind of, we're, we're coaching our team how to be patient and teaching our younger staff members through our processes and it, we have the tools, but then you have to step aside and start to ask the, the emotional questions of exactly what are we here to solve. I mean, there's plenty of times people come in thinking that we're going we're gonna to do tax planning, that's why they call us but there was no tax planning conversations in the hour at all. Yeah. That there was, there was no need to have that conversation. There was a need to support, uh, promote, encourage, and, and get excitement around getting, getting things on, on track. When it's a situation where you can just tell that you're gonna have to kind of walk them into a, a, a place where they're gonna feel comfortable, how much does that add to the complexity of what you, the services you provide? That's honestly the piece I enjoy, right, is, is asking the emotional questions or asking the right questions because uh, most people that meet with us, um, we certainly have plenty of people that are in tune they, through the experiences they've built to do this. Um, the enjoyment in working with somebody, they come and they don't know what they don't know. So we ask questions. So a lot of our meetings are just asking questions. Um, does your employer offer a 401k plan? Well, what is a 401k plan? Yeah. So yeah. look at so then we can stop and talk about that for a minute. Um, we'll call your employer if we have to real quick. Like yeah. maybe 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 your employer is one of our clients, yeah. and we're okay. We know you do. Um, so so and our staff have the opportunity to sit in uh, meetings and learn from that because that is hard to teach. If you've not been through some of those situations, you may not know what questions to ask. I want to thank our annual partners who make the Q and A live stream possible, including Pinnell CPA and, of course, this season's Underwriter Consumers Credit Union. Next season, we will return in a couple of months when we will talk about modern spaces, including the modern classroom and the modern workplace. You're not going to want to miss that. If you would like to recommend topics for the Q and A live stream, we'd love to hear from you. Visit www.surveyccf.com. As always, if you would like to support our ongoing nonprofit programming like the Q&A Livestream series, please visit qalivestream.org and click Donate. On behalf of our Board of Trustees at Cascade Community Foundation, we hope you found this season's topic on finance helpful. Good night.